Defenses by Scientist Cindy. Let's begin with the functions of the immune system. The functions of the immune system include to scavenge dead and dying body cells, to destroy abnormal or mutated cancerous cells, and to protect the body from pathogens and foreign molecules. This includes parasites, bacteria, and viruses. Our immune system has three lines of defense against foreign pathogens. Our physical and chemical barriers, which are the first line of defense, our nonspecific resistance, our immunity, as the second line of defense, and our specific resistance, which is our adaptive immunity as our third line of defense. The first line of defense of the body is preventative. These are the physical and chemical barriers that we have. The first physical barrier we will discuss is our skin. Our skin provides a physical barrier against infection by bacteria and viruses. Bacteria and viruses cannot penetrate the tightly knit skin cells. The reason for this is something called cell junctions. Here are three types of cell junctions, tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. Our skin cells or epithelial cells are held together tightly using these types of cell junctions. This creates a physical preventative barrier to keep the outside out and the inside in. Next, we'll talk about the mucous membranes as physical barriers of the body. Our mucous membranes are the linings of the respiratory system, the digestive system, and the urogenital tracts. It's important to note that special areas of interest for mucous membranes are the mouth, nose, eyelids, trachea, lungs, stomach, intestines, ureter, urethra, and the urinary bladder. The mucous membranes are made up of goblet cells and ciliated epithelial cells. The goblet cells have the job of secreting mucus. Mucus functions to cover and protect cells, to combat pathogens with antimicrobial peptides, and to trap those pathogens. The mucous membranes also have ciliated epithelial cells, and the cilia function to sweep away the pathogens once they are caught inside of the mucus. The mucus is then expelled from the body through coughing it up or swallowing it along with the pathogen. From there, it then can be removed from the body. Next, we can talk about the chemical barriers or chemical defenses we have on the outside of the body. We sweat. The skin has sweat glands. They secrete sweat and it has a high concentration of sodium. During perspiration, high levels of sodium can kill certain types of bacteria. We also have highly acidic environments. For example, the acidic environments of the urinary tract, stomach, and vagina discourages microbial growth. Lastly, we'll discuss lysozyme. Saliva and tears 
contains an enzyme called lysozyme that functions to block the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. When the bacterial cell wall cannot be synthesized or repaired, the bacteria dies soon after. Next, we'll discuss our body's second line of defense. This is the nonspecific resistance of the body. This is the innate immune system. Sometimes the body's physical and chemical barriers of the first line of defense are not enough to keep pathogens out of the body. When a pathogen or other suspicious substance is found inside of our body, the second line of defense goes into action. So how are these intruders identified? Step one is to identify self from non-self. The cells of each person's body has a unique molecular marker that tells the cells of the immune system that it belongs there and should not be destroyed. These molecular markers are called major histocompatibility complexes, or MHC, sometimes MHC1, to distinguish it from something called MHC2, which we'll discuss later. Only identical twins have identical MHCs. In fact, when an organ or tissue donor is being tested for a possible match, it is the similarity of the MHCs that helps determine compatibility. The immune system is constantly screening the cells of the body, checking for these MHC molecules, looking for any signs of foreign invaders or any signs of danger. Immune cells can use the MHCs to know if a cell is one of the following potential threats, a foreign invader, a damaged cell, an infected cell, or even a mutated or cancerous cell. Our second line of defense is our body's internal cellular and internal chemical defenses of the body. So these kick in once the pathogen has entered the body. We will begin our discussion talking about what we call defensive cells. We'll start with something called the phagocytes. Defensive cells are white blood cells called phagocytes that eat unwanted invaders of the body, as well as dead or damaged cells. The term phagocyte comes from the words for phage, which means to eat, and cyte, which means cell. So phagocytes will eat unwanted entities that it might find within the body. So phagocytes will eat unwanted entities found in the body by engulfing them, then chemically breaking them down in a process called phagocytosis. Phagocytes are nonspecific and will get rid of pathogenic organisms as well as dead or damaged cells, sometimes even just unwanted debris it may find in the body. In a sense, you can think of the phagocytes as the body's janitorial service. There are two types of phagocytes. The human body has two types of phagocytes. One are the neutrophils, sometimes called microphages, and the other are the monocytes. These are the macrophages. Both of these types of of phagocytes are white blood cells, but each of them have unique morphology and physiology and different mechanisms of action. The neutrophils. 
The neutrophils are one of the two types of white blood cells char characterized as phagocytes. These are the first responders on the scene. Macrophages. Monocytes or macrophages are the other types of white blood cells that are char characterized as phagocytes. Monocytes live in the lymphatic fluids. They are able to consume large particles of debris. They can consume large amounts as well, and they can eat a larger variety of, of things than the neutrophils can. Here we have a picture of a, micro, of a macrophage ingesting a bacterium, which is this rod-shaped structure you see here. The bacterium will be pulled inside the cell within a membrane-bound vesicle and will be quickly killed. Eosinophils. The eosinophils specialize in attacking pathogens that are too large for the macrophages to engulf, such as parasitic worms like this helminth here. Eosinophil eosinophils function by positioning themselves close to the pathogen. Then they release enzymes that kill the organism by breaking it down into smaller pieces. At this point, the macrophages can remove the smaller pieces using phagocytosis. Natural killer cells. Natural killer cells induce apoptosis or kill viruses infected or um, <laughs> Natural killer cells induce apoptosis or kill virus-infected or tumorous cells. Natural killer cells function in our cell-mediated cytotoxic innate immunity. Natural killer cells are constantly on patrol, seeking out any suspicious characters it might find within the body. Natural killer cells, sometimes abbreviated just as NK cells, will indiscriminately kill anything that it may perceive as abnormal. This means that the NK cells will not only destroy foreign invaders, but will also destroy the body's own cells that might show signs of mutation, infection, or disease. For example, Host cells that have become cancerous or have become infected with a virus are likely targets for these NK cells. The natural killer cells destroy their targets by coming into direct contact with these suspicious cells. Then they secrete proteins that will degrade the structural integrity of the membrane until the cell dies. In addition to defensive cells, the body's second line of defense also has defensive proteins. These defensive proteins include interferon and the complement system. Interferons. Interferons are proteins which act to slow down the process of viral reproduction. Once a cell has become infected with a virus, its days are numbered. Cells infected with a virus will secrete small proteins called interferons. The interferons will interfere, hence the name, with the ability of the virus to spread to the nearby cells. The complement system. 
The complement system refers to a large group of proteins that work together to complement or enhance the effect of the body's other defense mechanisms. There are a variety of ways that the complement system does this. One of the ways is illustrated below. Step one is that activated complement proteins can form holes in the cell wall and membrane of the bacterium. Step two, the bacterium can no longer contain a constant internal environment and water is able to enter the cell. Step three, the bacterium bursts and the pathogen is no longer a threat to the body. Next, we'll discuss another defensive strategy of our second line of defense, inflammation. Inflammation occurs as the result of some sort of internal injury or damage to the tissues. The inflammatory response is characterized by the four following signs, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. The red appearance is caused by the damaged cells releasing a chemical called histamine. Histamines function to widen the capillaries. When the capillaries widen, there is an increase in blood flow to the area. This increased blood flow causes this redness. Now, this red appearance is actually showing that something good is happening in the body. The widening of the capillaries assists in the healing process because the increased blood flow to the injured area allows defensive cells to, and proteins as well, to gain access to the area more easily. In inflammation, we also find that the area is warm to the touch. Why is this? Well, the increased blood flow to the area is also going to result in an elevation in temperature in the area of the injury. The increased temperature also increases the metabolic rate of the host cells in which the region is affecting. The increase in metabolic rate of the host cells in that region is going to help to promote healing in those host cells. The inflammatory response also involves swelling. This is because the histamines in the area are going to cause the small blood vessels, the capillaries, to become more permeable. These more permeable capillaries will then allow more fluids and substances to pass from the bloodstream to the tissues, which causes this swelling. However, this swelling is actually a good thing for the body. The swelling brings in vital nutrients and liquids from the bloodstream that promote healing in the area. In the first picture here, we see that tissue injury results in the release of chemical signals, including histamine. Dilation and increased leakiness of the blood vessels will lead to increased migration of the defensive cells, like the phagocytes, to the area. Phagocytes, the macrophages and neutrophils, are able to consume the bacteria and cell debris allowing the tissue to heal. The inflammatory response also includes pain. Pain often accompanies inflammation due to the excessive fluid that may have pressed on nerves. Pain may also be experienced due to toxins released by bacteria or prostaglandins. 
Pain is unpleasant, but it is protective. It is your body's way of letting you know that something is wrong and needs attention. Pain also causes a person to protect that area from further injury. Lastly, the second line of defense uses fever as a defensive strategy. A fever is defined as an ab A fever is defined as an abnormally high body temperature. Fevers are caused by chemicals classified as pyrogens. The word pyrogen comes from the word pyro, meaning fire, and gen, meaning generator. Pyrogens function to stimulate the hypothalamus to raise the internal body temperature. Pyrogens can come from one of two different sources. They can come from the body as one of the second lines of defense, but they can also come from toxins produced by certain bacteria. Regardless of the source of pyrogen, the result is the same. In what ways do fevers help the body fight pathogens and heal from disease? Well, way number one is by slowing down the growth of pathogens. Fevers cause the liver and spleen to remove iron from the blood. Since many bacteria require iron to reproduce, the reproductive process is slowed down while the fever is present. Way number two is by increasing the metabolic rate of cells. Increasing the metabolic rate of the defensive cells makes them turbocharged where they can work faster than usual. However, there is definitely the possibility of having too much of a good thing when it comes to a fever. Fevers that go over 105 degrees Fahrenheit in adults can be life-threatening. This is due to the denaturing of enzymes that are needed for these valuable metabolic processes done in each of our cells. The third line of defense is our adaptive immune response. These destroy invading pathogens specifically. It's accomplished by the adaptive immune response. Let's look at the difference between the innate or non-specific immune system versus the adaptive or specific immune system. So the innate immune system includes the first and second lines of defense also called nonspecific immune responses. And in the first and second lines of defense, the, um, the defense mechanisms are all based on a general identification of threats, and you're also born with them, they're innate, uh, they're not adaptive. They respond more quickly, uh, actually much more quickly than, um, than our adaptive immune system does and they are ready to fight at all times versus our adaptive immune system, which is our third line of defense. <clears throat> the adaptive immune system uses specific antigens to strategically launch an immune response. Um, the adaptive immune system is acquired after birth due to exposure to different pathogens. It is much slower to respond to threats and infections than the innate immune system is, and it is not ready to fight at all times. It becomes activated only after there has been an exposure. Also, only the adaptive immunity, um, immune system has the ability to have memory. It has an immunological memory to learn about threats and enhance the immune responses for the future. The adaptive immune response 
involves B cells and T cells, recognizing antigens and producing antibodies. The cells of the immune system are the B cells and T cells. The B cells and T cells are derived from hem hematopoietic stem cells in the red bone marrow. B cells are called B cells because they mature in the bone marrow. T cells are called T cells because they are going to mature in the thymus. B cells, once they mature in the bone marrow, will then move out into the lymphatic system, and then they will reside in the secondary lymphatic organs, awaiting for activation. The secondary lymphatic organs include your adenoids, spleen, tonsils, lip nodes, and thymus. The B cells will stay in the secondary lymphatic organs until it has been activated due to the presence of an antigen. Antigens and antibodies. What are antigens? Antigens are defined as anything that has the ability to provoke an immune response. Antigens can be viruses, bacteria, or other molecules. Antibodies, or immunoglobulins, are proteins produced by the immune system that are specifically designed to bind to specific antigens. A B cell's entire purpose in life is to identify antigens, to alert the immune system that an antigen has been found, and to secrete antibodies. B cells produce antibodies or immunoglobulins that they can also place on their cell surface. These membrane-bound antibodies act like keys and are able to bind and uh, are able to bind antigens, <coughs> kind of like a lock. Each B cell contains antibodies like a key. They are specific to only one antigen. Each key is specific for only one binding site on the antigen. A pathogen can have many ant antigens, but the B cell has only one key to one antigen. The invasion. When an antigen invades the body, it will encounter many B cells. Since, since each B cell is specific to only one antigen, the antigen may come across a multitude of B cells that it does not bind with before it comes across a B cell that it does. The B cell will keep trying different keys until it finds a match. Once the B cell finds a match, it takes the antigen into itself through the process of endocytosis. The antigen is then fragmented. Once the antigen is inside of the B cell, the B cell will break down the antigen and it will break it down into smaller fragments. The B cell then uses these fragments to create NHC2 molecules that are displayed on the B cell's surface. At this stage, the B cell can also be called an antigen presenting cell. The T cells will then bind to the NHC2 complex and will become activated. The activated T cells release cytokines that cause the B cells to undergo rapid cell division. The B cell begins to proliferate.
the B cell proliferates to form specialized memory B cells and effector B cells. Memory cells are involved in what's called the secondary immune response. This means that if the same antigen invades the body again in the future, thousands of memory B cells will be all ready to go and will quickly jump into action and destroy the invader. Effector B cells, otherwise called plasma cells, will then secrete millions of antibodies that are specific to the antigen that was found. These antibodies are able to bind to the antigen that caused the immune response. Also, the originally activated B cell can also leave the secondary lymphatic organ that it has been residing in. The activated B cell will then circulate throughout the body's humors in search of more of the same antigens that it can bind to. When the B cell encounters an antigen, the B cell will lock onto it <clears throat> and it will act in a variety of different ways that ultimately will lead to the death of the invader. Thank you for watching.